I don't care about the boxes and labels. I don't care about the rules. I will throw all of the rules out if it is the opposite of what you need. So for me, I'm all about meeting you where you are. And what I discovered in you know 20 years of doing this is that if you don't understand the root cause of your clutter, meaning how clutter is helping you, and that's a big concept for people to understand. If you don't understand how clutter is helping you, no system that you apply is going to work. And if you know how clutter is helping you and you really face it, which is a very brave thing to do, any system will work because you've solved the causation of the clutter. Here's the thing about grief. It's painful. We all know that. And it's not fair that we know also. And it can bring up a whole host of emotions that we want to escape from. In fact, the whole thing may be so overwhelming, we bury ourselves in clutter. Now, this definitely was me in a sense. I had just shifted into a new home and I couldn't face the mountain of boxes waiting to be unpacked. It seemed like every box contained a memory I just didn't want to face. And forget about trying to sort your loved one's stuff out. That was on a whole nother level. It was just like I shut that out for a long time and I just let it kind of just take care of itself. And then there was the unexpected knocks at the door. And you just don't want anyone stepping in and seeing that you're just not coping despite outward appearances. So to a degree, I understand this. And my mum, my mum, bless her soul, well, she she was surrounded in clutter. And this made me try not to be like that. So I've got lots of things I'm resonating with. So this is a very, very special episode to me. And if this is you or someone you know, then you're going to love today's guest, Star Hansen. And she is called the Clutter Whisperer, and for very good reason. She has appeared on over 30 TV shows, given a TEDx talk, is the author of a book that we'll get into today, and she can help you not only feel good about your clutter, but demystify the whole process for you. So a very warm welcome to the beautiful side of Grief Star. Oh, thank you, Helen. It's so great to be here with you. I've I've loved listening to your lovely podcast and the way that you are finding hope in such a painful topic is just absolutely beautiful, Helen. So thank you for what you're doing. And I'm just really honored to be here with you today. Oh, thank you, Star, for that. I really appreciate you saying that because sometimes you're sitting here by yourself and you just don't know the impact that you're making upon others. Just probably like you, you are changing lives thank by you. the truckload. And it, it's great to be chatting with you today. And I want to start off just by you sharing what you shared with Oprah and her audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave her the skeleton key of organizing. I gave her the secrets for folding a fitted sheet, the elusive and ever frustrating topic. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. I went in there, I showed how to fold a fitted sheet and I will just out myself. I do not like folding. I oh. one of my first jobs out of school was in retail and yeah. I just would have rather licked the floor than folded. It's so when I come up with a folding system, it is because I would rather be doing anything. So I want it easy, simple, basic. <laughs> um, so you can trust that if I'm teaching you how to fold, it's going to be <laughs> like bar low barrier to entry, super easy. <laughs> oh, I love that. And, and it really touched my heart too, because Oprah was really, I'm going to out myself here. Oprah was was my companion on many a walk with her wisdom and her sage advice and all the wonderful guests she had on many a walk I went on during lockdown, yeah. during the pandemic, and, and it just helped shift my mindset. So I'm really grateful <laughs> to her. So that, that was sort of like, oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> now, I'd like you to share the lovely story of you and your grandpa and what you discovered 
when you decided to sort out his personal belongings? Yeah, there is such a stigma in our society about clutter being bad. You know, there's just this conversation that, you know, if we have an excess of stuff, there's something wrong with us, that there's something wrong with the objects. And when I was a teenager, my grandfather passed away and I hadn't been particularly close to him. We lived in different cities and, you know, family can be complicated. We'll just, we'll just leave it at that. And (laughs) when he passed away, um, we went to the city where he lived and my parents and my aunts and uncles were all planning the funeral. And I just made the decision that I was going to organize and clear his bedroom. And because I thought, what can I do to be of service? And went in and started, you know, organizing and decluttering and cleaning up. And what was beautiful was that I really started to learn who he was. This man who I had never met or really had much engagement with in my consciousness as, you know, a human so far, I started noticing what he kept, what he valued, how his brain worked just by seeing what he kept, like very organized stacks of paper told me that he was very left brain, logical, very curious about things. He kept lots of articles and you could tell by his little pockets of projects, you know, like the pocket watch he was working on or the the other little projects that were sitting there mid mid work or completion. I was starting to really see he had this engineer's brain and the way that he just lived his life started to feel like it was opening up to me. And it was so beautiful where in a time where I was grieving and not only grieving this man, you know, leaving, but also grieving, not knowing this man who I knew was supposed to be really important to me. I had the wonderful experience of getting to know him through that journey. And it has shifted how I look at people's stuff ever since. That touched my heart also because a kudos to you. That that was a great thing to be doing for everyone because I know it's something that people can put off is sorting through their loved one's belongings and, you know, they just don't want to go there. But the fact that you made it so beautiful, like it was a real journey for you. And I love that. I love that you found that. And this is the energy about you that I really enjoy. And I picked it up from your box book, and I'm definitely picking it up from hearing you speak as well, that you have this beautiful, compassionate side to you. So tell us the background to this. Had you always been a very organized person growing up, and and what really made you decide to get into this, this field? Because it's not one people would opt for usually. (laughs) Completely. So I guess the answer to that question depends on who you ask. I think really. (laughs) So I shared a bedroom with my sister and my sister was, she was always a free spirit. She did not like rules. She did what she wanted, how she wanted to. And, you know, I remember we would have to clean our bedroom because we're kids, we're using our toys, we're doing our thing. And we were taught by our parents that if you go to someone's home and you play with their toys, you help clean up before you leave. So I feel like cleaning and organizing was very much a part of how we, like was a value in how we grew up. But we shared, my sister and I shared a room and I remember having to clean the room and our versions of that were quite different. Like she would lay on the bed and look at me and say, princesses don't work. That was one that I will never forget. (laughs) Um, and if she was left to her own devices, she would just take everything and shove it in the closet. And so it was as the big sister, it was this feeling of, you know, oh gosh, having to do the work of two people. But that's also me looking back as we all rewrite our own narratives. I wonder, you know, from an outside perspective, what that was really like, but I started moving very young. I used to spend summers with family in another city. And because of that, I would pack up a lot and go there for the summer. And then right after high school, I moved away. So because I have this nomadic nature, I tend to be quite organized because I move so much and that's really common. So I feel like it's been a necessity to streamline, keep things organized because I'm always kind of thinking two steps ahead. And to be clear, this might be a trauma response. We're working on it. But, (laughs) you know, it's I'm always very aware that where I'm at is probably not where I'm going to be because this creative part of my brain calls me into next chapter. So I think organizing is a natural part of who I am, Mm -hmm. but it's also a part of where I'm always on the move. And the other thing that I will share that I think is so funny when I look back is 
when I would have to clean the bathroom when I was a kid and it was never dirty enough for me to be interested in cleaning it. So what I would need to do to want to clean it is to mess it up. So I would, I mean, how my mom didn't kill me, I do not know. I would take lotion and put it on the counters, lipstick on the mirror. And then I would do, and this was before, this was the 80s, y'all. This was before there was, you know, like organizing shows. I would do this whole production about me cleaning the bathroom, but it had to be dirty. And the irony is that the, or the connection is that as an organizer, it always looks worse before it's better. So I get everything I need through organizing because I get to make your house look way worse and then I get to make it look perfect. And so it's, 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 you know, your life plans for you, things you can't plan for yourself. So I guess it was no surprise to your parents that you went into organizing. Not really. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I, I think it's important at this stage to define clutter. And is there a big difference between clutter and hoarding? Oh, for sure. I love this question for a lot of different reasons. So we will just say that clutter is an overabundance of stuff. It's, mm-hmm. it's when you perceive that there's too much because someone might have 3,000 books in their home. And if they're a researcher or a librarian, that might be an appropriate number. But for someone who never reads, 3,000 would feel like clutter. So it's all based on your perspective and your needs and your use of items. Now, and thank you for talking about it as hoarding. It's, you know, I just want to name that it's so dangerous when we label people as hoarders because people are not hoarders. And I understand, look, I did TV for a very long time. And In television, we do what we can to get the hook to get you interested. And that was a clever, crafty name. And unfortunately, it doesn't really respect. I love the people who work on that show. I'm very grateful for their beautiful work. But the title is problematic because it seems like it's putting a label on what is actually a behavior. You can hoard without having hoarding disorder. The best way to talk about it is if someone has hoarding disorder. Now, that means that someone has been diagnosed. It's you know, in the DSM-5, it's known as it's a mental health state that requires support. And but the experience of hoarding, the behavior of hoarding is just that collection, that gathering. And we can even nuance it even further, right? Is it a is it a compulsion that stems from an emotional trauma, like what often happens in hoarding disorder? Absolutely. It can also just be that you are a collector. And a lot of that comes back to how you keep those items. Are they thrown haphazardly, getting broken, you can't see them? That's more hoarding behavior. That's a little bit like, you know, when when the pinata breaks and we just grab the candy and we don't look at where it's going, we just gather, 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 versus collecting, curating, putting it on display, looking at it. There are such nuances between the different behaviors. And what we have to really do is be as mindful as we can about people's behavior and how they identify themselves. I had a friend call me recently and said, my friend is hoarding and how can I help him? And I said, well, you can't unless he has asked for help. You wouldn't walk up to someone who's overweight and say, you need to lose weight. I hired a personal trainer for you or here's a book. That would be considered rude and inappropriate. And yet people feel very justified to comment on someone else's clutter, the state of their home. And the truth is, it's none of our business unless they ask for help, because we don't know if it's a problem for them or not. I'm so glad you clarified that, because that was one of my questions that I was going to ask you, is that, you know, what about the well-meaning friend, relative, neighbor, whoever, who 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 makes a decision that that person needs to take action, when in fact, it needs to wait until they're ready to take action. Yeah. And the best thing that you can do, I mean, I say this to people all the time. If you see someone who is struggling with clutter, please, for the love of all that is holy, do not tell them that they have a problem and that all they need to do is get rid of stuff. If you think that you are telling them something they don't already know, I like that's just not possible. They know that they're struggling with this. They know they just quote unquote need to get rid of stuff. There is a block that they're facing that's stopping them from being able to take that action. So when you say that, even in a very well-meaning way, what you're doing is shaming them, making them feel like they're not doing enough and that they should be doing more. And you're they're putting up a wall to keep you out because it doesn't feel safe. Now, what you can do instead is you can get really curious 
if they are in a process of organizing, asking them, did you find anything really interesting today? Tell me a story about something that you found, or did you realize anything about yourself today? Get curious in their experience, because for some people, especially those who hoard, they may never live a clutter-free life. And knowing that that's the case means that you want to be interested in them, not the end result. We want to celebrate the journey, not the destination. Absolutely. And you know that for some people, that is their comfort. They just Big time. safe being surrounded by that and yeah like you say who are we to judge which is what I really love about you you are so non-judgmental thank you <laughs> and so let's have a chat about your book which is why the F am I still not organized yes. because I think this ties in really nicely to you mentioned that you were in television and doing tv shows about organizing but you felt dissatisfied and and I feel like you've got a totally different approach, which you bring out in your book, which is highly compassionate, non-judgmental. Why do you suppose you have this approach when the majority of people would be opposite? Yeah. So I know that I'm a healer. I've always known that about myself. And it's as though most of my, you know, kind of life's purpose journey before I found this was holding on to the thread that I knew I was a healer and being open to where that was going to manifest. And I think that's a big part. I don't care about the boxes and labels. I don't care about the rules. I will throw all of the rules out if it is the opposite of what you need. So for me, I'm all about meeting you where you are. And what I discovered in you know 20 years of doing this is that if you don't understand the root cause of your clutter, meaning how clutter is helping you, and that's yes. a big concept for people to understand. If you don't understand how clutter is helping you, no system that you apply is going to work. And if you know how clutter is helping you and you really face it, which is a very brave thing to do, any system will work because you've solved the causation of the clutter. And that's what I help people do. I help them figure out how, the, how to address the root cause and really see it. And I think that you have to have a very special personality to do that because you, I imagine that this is not a safe place for people to go because there's many, many different reasons why people would want to have this clutter around them. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's go into some of those reasons and, yeah. and why so you are doing so well. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So I I mean, this is the thing that I love to talk about most yes. because yeah. it's not something we talk about. We tend to look at clutter and beat ourselves up. I'm lazy. What am I doing wrong? Or as you were describing with having to move or unpack your boxes, oh no, there's a monster in my closet and yeah. I can't face it. And so we look at, okay, why is the clutter here? Why has it built? I'll I'll do a lot of, you know, discovery work. When did the clutter start? Have you always had clutter? Are there patterns of the clutter? We're looking at where it stacks up, what it is, what room it is. And what I'm looking for through all of these discovery questions is how it's helping you. And so I'll give you a few examples. So okay, clutter, great. yeah, clutter can sometimes be a protector. One of the stories I love to share is I had a client who we kept organizing his office and it would instantly get decluttered again the minute we were done. <laughs> And after a few you know, months of doing this, we explored what was going on and he had had a break-in. And for him, he felt vulnerable to have his office uncluttered because if it was uncluttered, burglars would be able to find his valuables more easily. And until we found and addressed a real location for items that made him feel safe, the clutter kept showing up. I had another client who lived at home with their parents. It was, you know, during college time and they were needing that autonomy and they wanted to launch, but they weren't able to, as a lot of kids aren't able to launch right now. And same thing, we would organize, get it all in great shape. I'd leave. I'd have to come back a month later because it was back to the same state again. And after a few months, it was exploring, okay, well, what do you think it's, how do you think it's helping you? And she said, well, when there, when there's clutter, my parents can't come in here. They won't come in here when it's clutter. <laughs> And so I said, well, what if we clutter the first three feet and then the rest of the room stays disorganized? You can build a wall of clutter, but you don't, you know, 
need to clutter yourself. And simultaneously, let's talk about the boundaries that need to be set with your parents. What do you need in order to feel like you can maintain your autonomy while living at home and asking them for what you need and coming to a nice place? And once she had done that, the clutter went away and I've literally not gone back to her house ever since. And she launched like shortly thereafter. It was really beautiful. I have clients who, you know, they will use it to feel empowered or strong or like they have their needs met. So for a lot of people who grew up in lack and scarcity, I have had multiple clients who've had, who have hundreds of pairs of jeans because growing up, they only had one pair. And there was so much shame for them around not having enough that when they became an adult, they needed that feeling of security. And then they kind of overcompensated to the point that they couldn't function in their room. And I, I am not going to come in and say that 200 pairs of jeans are wrong. I don't know what it is to live through scarcity to that degree. My great-grandmother lived through the depression. My great-grandfather said, she has suffered in ways I don't know. She can have as much food in the house as she wants. And she did. She had an overflowing pantry her entire life. And after, you know, how many years of not having enough and trying to raise kids on no food, that was what she required until her death to feel safe and secure. And so we look at these things that can't even be simple. Like if you were raised in a military family and you traveled around a lot as a kid, you might have experienced that clutter is consistent and humans are not. So your clutter may be a companion. It may make you feel like you have comfort or presence or that you're not alone. And that's what we really want to do. We want to start to explore the positive side of what your clutter might actually be doing to help you. And I mean, you can tell I can go on about this all day, so I will leave it there. But I love this conversation. (laughs) So do you think for people, because that's a great example. So do you think for people, until you ask them these discovery questions, is it all happening at a subconscious level or at a conscious level? Mostly subconscious. Now, before I wrote the book, it would take me years. I mean, I would work with someone for years and I might say to them, I I have a membership too. And sometimes there's people in the membership and I would say, what is your clutter doing for you? And they would look at me like a deer in the headlights and say, it's not doing anything for me. And then once the book came out and I really laid out how it helps us communicate with each other, the ways it shows up, now people show up to the membership and they're like, okay, so my clutter is helping me avoid my husband because I'm not happy with this particular thing in our relationship. And what I need to do is learn to set boundaries with him. And they come in with like the keys to the kingdom and ready to roll, which is just the joy of my life. Fantastic. Oh my gosh, that must fill your heart. It does. It really does. (laughs) You're a healer, but you also have this wonderful ability to see through clutter and what's behind it. Like you walk into a room and you can almost, before somebody opens their mouth, work out what's going on with them. So tell us about that. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm a little bit psychic. I will just preface that. So I don't have a magical skill. I think everyone is a little bit psychic. I'm just very willing and open to lean into mine. And yeah, I can I always say I can walk into your house and see what's going on based on the state of your stuff. And so that can look like, you know, your nightstands telling me who wears the pants in your family. Sometimes it's sometimes it's just pragmatic like that where I see one person has like a nightstand and it's decked out and has lotion and pictures and everything and the other person has like a card table or no nightstand and that tells me something about the power dynamics or self-care even because every room illustrates a different area of our lives and so the room tells me a lot. Yeah, so it's and it really is interesting. So sometimes I will see visible things that show me. And other times it's more of a psychic hit. I will never forget walking into a house and the family wasn't there yet. It was for a TV show. And I did a walkthrough of the house with the crew. They were recording me and I would get to this one area. And every time I walked onto this landing, I thought I was going to throw up to the point where I told them I refuse to stand in this hallway until the family's here because I'm going to throw up. I can't, I'm going to get sick. I can't do this. And they came and I said, I don't know what's here, but I need you all to clear this out. Something is here. And they cleared everything out. And I said, okay, great, fantastic. And, you know, and I looked around and I said, wait, you're done? And they're like, yeah, we're done. And I said, this giant box, you forgot this giant box. There was like a huge box. And I said, what's in there? And they said, alcohol. 
And I said, okay. And I thought they were joking. They were not joking. And I said, tell me more about this. And they had had a loved one who went on a bender and got really self-destructive. And so they as a family made the decision to completely come off the alcohol and they put it in this box and upstairs. And I could feel that. And until we dumped that alcohol out, took it downstairs, did some healing ceremonies about releasing it, then I then I didn't feel nauseous and that energy opened for them. And what was fascinating was is their bedroom that had been kind of stuck for a while. We were able to do that room in an hour and a half. Something that might have taken hours or days was so quick because the thing that was blocking the energy got removed and opened the energy for the rest of the rooms in that space to be cleared and organized. No. Oh. What a story. I think you're psychic as well because you keep going into my questions. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just about to ask you something and then you start talking about it. I'm going, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's your podcast. No. I'll step back. <laughs> no, I'm totally happy with whatever Great. you choose to share when you share it. It's, it's <laughs> fine. I just thought it was quite a hard case. <laughs> so tell us about what all the rooms represent. Oh, my because gosh. Because you go into that in your book. And I thought that was fascinating. I had never, ever come across that before. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, if we look, most people know about feng shui and they know, mm-hmm. okay, this this is the room for loved ones. This is the room for health. This is, and I look at the home in a slightly different way. I do love feng shui. There's a lot I really love about it. But what, in my experience as an organizer, and I will just say there's room for all of the modalities. There's room for everyone to have a different niche. I'm not, an ex, I'm not exclusionary in that way. Like I think there's room for it all. You just have to find what works for you. So for me, I think that you dictate the meaning of the room. So, you know, where you spend time with your family is probably the center of connection and community. Where you feel the most nourished, whether it be food or exercise or partnership, is probably where your nourishment zone is, right? You, you know, and that's what we want to look. There are some rooms, and I say this in the book, that are pretty standard. Like kitchen often tends to be communication hub and nourishment. Bedroom tends to be self-care and partnership. Living room tends to be community connection and hobbies. The garage or attic spaces tend to be, you know, our future, our past, and just overflow from the rest of our lives, as well as kind of like our hidden secrets. And these are just some high level ideas, but you know what your rooms mean. And what I like to do is kind of explore because there's no accident to our clutter. And like the most people, I, I work with people who have recurring clutter and I don't really work with people. It's not that I don't work with people, but this is not people in that state don't come to me. Most people who just have one-off clutter. Oh, I just moved. I need to unpack. Oh, you know, I inherited this stuff. I need to assimilate it into my objects. Oh, I, you know, downsized. I need to pare down. That's not who often calls me. The people who call me are, hey, I've been struggling with this pile for 10 years. I don't know why I can't make it go away. Why does the clutter keep showing up in my bedroom? Why does the clutter keep showing up here? And we start to unpack what's going on in that specific nuance. So the more specific you can get, the better. So I tell a story in my TEDx talk about a gentleman that I worked with and his house was perfect. It was beautiful. And we walked into the bedroom and the only clutter in there was on the side of the bed where his partner would go if he had a partner and on top of the partner side of the bed. (laughs) And uh, yeah, and I was like, oh, so somebody's got a block around romantic love. And he did. He, He struggled because he had had someone really hurt him and it was hard to come back from that. And as we decluttered, and this is the power and magic of decluttering. We didn't have to sit and talk and do therapy about how he was guarding himself and what was going on. You can do it from either side. We can address your clutter from a deeper perspective. You can talk to your therapist. You can achieve more you know, boundaries or whatever it is that you're missing that are that's causing the clutter to show up. Or you can start to shift the clutter and that shifting of energy is going to invite in the changes that you need to have and it's going to energetically be like an alchemy that helps you heal whether you're being super conscious about it or not. And that's what I love about it. So he had mentioned to me at one point about the heartbreak midway through the process and shortly after we finished working, he met and got engaged to an absolutely lovely person and he's still with her to this day. And there's no accident. So to me, the spaces and organizing are an invitation to heal. They're an, a journey of evolution. It's not a task to complete and it's not proof of your defects. It's really an invitation into expanding into our next level of ourselves. 
Oh my gosh, you just hit a nerve with me there because <laughs> when you were describing that clutter on the bed. So that's what I do. I stack up my books and my journals and my cards that I do and like that, all on that other side of the bed. And yeah. and and yes, that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm protecting yeah. myself from getting hurt again. And because, it's, it's yeah. acting as your partner. Your intellectual yeah. journey and your yeah. self-development journey is your partner. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't expect that to come out while I was talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I invite all sorts of weird things to come out. Yeah. But, it's, but it's, and I'm, I'm grateful and I'm sure your listeners are very grateful for you to share because you're not alone. And the yes. fact that you're open yeah. to it, I can't tell you how many times I try to be a mirror of that behavior to people and they'll say, no star, it's just you know, my projects, I just have to work on them late at night. It's my remote office. And yes. yes, that may be true. And the logic is there. And absolutely on a practical level, you're doing that. And what if there is something bigger going on? And and what if you don't even have to change it? What if it's okay that you allow yourself to have your partner be your self-care path or your, you know, like, and then you get to choose one that changes. You don't need to go out and we're not all ready for the love of our life, or maybe we're done when we already had it and we want something different now. There is nothing wrong with you having that space in your life filled with something different than partnership. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, this is such good information. Star, let's talk emotions. As I imagine, there's a whole host of shame, guilt, resentment, and so on wrapped up in clutter. Yeah. I always tell people that the biggest thing that's stopping you from getting organized is the emotions, the overwhelm, the fear, the shame, the sadness, the grief. Mm -hmm. And the best thing you can do to get organized happens before you start to get organized. And that is to learn how to name your feelings and start to be present to them and ideally process them. And what this means is that it makes organizing a much slower process. We look at the TV shows, we look at the before and after pictures on Instagram and Pinterest, and we think, yeah, I want that. And for a lot of us, we think we're behind. I should have been organized five years ago. I'm so behind yeah. this anxiety that thrives in us. And when we work from that anxious place, we miss the magic in our clutter. And what we want to do is go slow enough to be present to what's there. You and I have both had substantial losses in our lives, and I don't know many people who haven't. And when we are in a certain phase of our lives where we have ex experienced these losses, and sometimes they're loss of a human, I also, you know, I share about this freely that I'm also childless. I thought I would be yes. married and have 10 kids at the age of, you know, 20. And I'm I'm not 20, and I don't have any kids, and that window is real small, right? It's a little non-existent, it's yeah. a little sliver, maybe, yeah. So, and I've had to grieve that, and the truth is that being childless means that I will be grieving that for the rest of my life. When people have grandchildren, I will be grieving that. When I grieve it right now, when I'm like, I could totally have a baby, I'm in like my last few years, but <laughs> everyone else my age, their kids are graduating college. Is that where I want to be? <laughs> Like, I don't, but so we have to make space for the grief that comes up. We need to know how to manage it. And what I will say is one of the best things you can do is one, be able to go slow enough to be present to the feelings that are there. Sit, breathe through the feelings, name them, process them, talk to a friend about them. One of the things that we do in the Chaos to Calm community is we organize together because doing it with someone else can be so powerful sharing what happened while you were organizing or telling a story can be exactly what you need in order to move through your objects faster. And just a little, you know, side note for anyone who's grieving a loved one or a chapter change or a, you know, a greater loss in their lives. If you have objects pertaining to that loss around your house, my suggestion is to create little memory boxes for that chapter or that person. And how I view it is I view it visiting them. So my my sister passed and I have two boxes for her. And, and when it's her anniversary or her birthday, I pull that box out. I bring the items that I want and I surround myself with them for those weeks. I build an altar. I do whatever 
I need to do to feel her close and feel like I'm honoring her and honoring myself. And then at the end of that time, I put everything back in the box and put it away. I've been able to visit with her without having to feel the pain of that grief on a day that I need to be productive or on a day where I'm madly in love or on a day that I am tired. I'm not putting that potential landmine in front of me, ready to demolish me and send me back into a flashback or a grief spiral. Oh, such a good suggestion. And my heart goes out to you about children. I know it's different because I got to have my my daughter for 18 years. So that is completely different. But what we used to joke about was like, she'll go, oh, you'll be looking after my kids, ma'am. She used to call me the baby whisperer. And so we used to joke about this. And, and there was always that expectation that I would have these grandchildren that I would get to share time with them when they would fill my heart up. And I've just been with a beautiful friend and and hung out with her and her grandbabies. And, oh, my gosh, it was so delicious. And we talked about this. We talked about this is how I need to feel that side of me that is 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 empty because of it and so oh my gosh star yeah thank you one of the things i say a lot is thank you i always say fill your space with life not stuff so the hardest day for me of the week is sunday because for some reason in my mind sunday is family day and so when i wake up and all of my friends have their toddlers and their kids or their spouses and you know, and look, they look at me and they're like, Star is living our dream. She is free. She moves when she wants. She lives in gorgeous places. She has a career. Like, you know, the things that they're having to wait to do until the kids are older, I'm doing now. <clears throat> Excuse me. And 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 yet I wake up on the Sunday and I'm like, ooh, I don't have a partner, kids, all these things that normally give you a tethering. And so what I've had to do is learn how to fill my time, my space with things that bring me joy, because if not, I will let this shame spiral, this grief spiral take me down because, you know, childless and is, is such a challenging thing because one of the things we think to ourselves is what's wrong with me, which is, by the way, what half of society is asking about us as well, which is super fun, everyone. It's really like, I think I'm amazing. And, and simultaneously, people are also thinking like, why is she still single? What's under the hood? You know, like it's, it's not enjoyable. But so it, it really takes a lot to move through it. And for those of us who are carrying any big wound, right? I know even like my sister's passing, there are people who don't want to be around me when I'm grieving. It is very uncomfortable. They do not, I'm a downer to them when I'm, when I'm grieving and that's fine. Fair enough. But we need space. We really need space to be authentic, to process our emotions. And then we need to start to fill our life with things that bring us joy. Now, Part of this understanding our emotions, you have a list that identifies a lot of emotions and so people can say, yep, that's what I'm feeling when I, when I look at this and how I, what I feel when I need to deal with this. These are those emotions. But I, let's take it one step further because you also mentioned that Brene Brown has a great list of emotions and what they mean. So it's like, places we go when things are uncertain or too much. They are the emotions of stress and overwhelm and anxiety and worry and avoidance, excitement, I think, dread, fear and vulnerability. Those were the ones she listed there. I think that was like really clear to understand because when we start to get that level of understanding about our emotions, then we're able to start moving through them. Yes. And so this is a very important part of the process, isn't it? Very much. When I read, so I used to utilize Abraham Hicks' um, emotional guidance scale. For a long time, that's what I used. And because I love how it kind of shows all of our emotions and we can work our way through it. So I've loved that. And then when Brene Brown came out with Atlas of the Heart, I fell so in love with that. I started teaching a monthly class on unpacking emotions because it's just that important because this is the thing that derails us when we're trying to get started. It's the thing that will stop us from finishing. If you are having a hard time starting or finishing, 
it's probably an, an emotion that you're uncomfortable being present to. And so what I did when I wrote the book is I came up with my own because Brene's was amazing. And as I was reading it, I felt like I was getting such healing just from someone naming the the meaning of words that we use without thinking about them. Like I remember um, the word ashamed was like the minute I read that definition, it was like a mic drop in my life. I thought, that's why I can't get over that thing that happened when I was 19 because I'm not honoring myself. And it was so life-changing. And so when I wrote the book, I came up with a list that I thought, well, people need just like a one. Some people, it's too much to go that deep. They don't want to do that. Yeah, so yeah. I created a one page where we could just look at the emotions that tend to come up when we're organizing. And your listeners can get that if they want. It's at starhanson.com yeah. forward slash feelings list. And that will just give you those words. And it just helps to have that with you when you're organizing so that you've got it close by and you can name them. And I will say, Probably my favorite takeaway from that book, Helen, was she says, we talk about shame with organizing. And she says, the antidote for shame is connection. And for most of us, we are walking around feeling shame and hiding, putting a, you know, closing the blinds and the door and telling people we're not home. And that's actually the opposite of what we need to be doing. And again, this is why I created the community because it was, it's so healing to, in your own time, as slowly as you need to, slowly let people in and show them what's going on behind the doors of your home. Because what happens is people don't go running for the hills. They don't say, oh, gross, at least not in my community. That's not going to happen. But it's, you know, it's what happens is people say, me too. Thank you for sharing. Oh my gosh, I have the same thing. Like there's so much camaraderie and love and kindness and healing that comes from allowing people to see something that we think is absolutely mortifying and that we can share with no one because the truth is that the clutter is not proof of your defects. The pr- the clutter is proof of your genius. It's proof of your beauty. It's proof of the beautiful purpose that you came to walk here on this earth. And if I can do anything, I want to help people embrace themselves more deeply by embracing their clutter in a new way. Oh, and you're doing that in a beautiful, beautiful way. The flip side of that, of course, is people who live in perfect homes when oh, nothing yes. is out of place and there's, you know, everything is perfectly dusted and um, and please don't sit there. <laughs> I mean, well, that was like your family, right? You're, well, I'm sure that like your your parents' generation was very much in that world of the house is supposed to look nice for company. It has to be beautiful. And most of most people in in your generation and trickling down to the younger generations never learned how to organize or keep a house because we had someone else doing it for us or you know like they like they wanted to micromanage how the house turned out so they weren't interested in you learning or being a part of the community in that way they just wanted it to look right and you're right i think there can be as much um disharmony in a super, super tidy, obsessive home as there can be about a home that has a lot of clutter. I think it's yeah. the same, you know, it's just energy and how we do things. Yeah. Yeah. My granny was the one that had a very super organized home. She was so amazing. Everything had its place. Wow. And that, but she was so kind and beautiful and generous. And that she, it was a, a home with great energy. My mom, on the other hand, as I mentioned, Hers was clutter, and I was always so embarrassed to bring friends home. I never, I never brought friends home to our place. Um, you know, I struggled living there because I wanted to organize it, and I didn't know how, yeah. and I couldn't. You know, there was no way that I could do anything with this clutter, and it set me on a tailspin many a time because I just didn't know how to live in this environment that wasn't comfortable to me. Yeah, And so I stressed a lot during that time and when I lived there. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> no, uh, well, and I just want to say thank you for sharing that because you've named so beautifully the flip of clutter. It's so normal that one person in the family will have a high degree of clutter. The next person goes the opposite direction, right? So we kind of have this flipping that goes on and yes. it's an interesting thing. It's I appreciate you sharing what you shared and thank you because... 
it is difficult to grow up in a home where you don't have control of your own spaces, how things look, being able to function, having people in. Some people are currently living with a partner and that's the state of their home. Some people grew up in that environment. And as much as I am very pro clutter and pro people embracing it, It's also, I just want to honor the fact that it is very challenging for a lot of people to have to live in that environment and have it not affect them in a deep way because it has been proven to spike our cortisol and create anxiety and stress and affect our sleep. And to grow up in that environment is very difficult. So I appreciate you you sharing it. And, And I will say most people that I know who have created cluttered homes in that way know that the impact that they're having on their family and they feel a lot of grief about it. So it's, it really is something that we want to heal in a deep systemic way so that every member of the family gets seen and loved and, you know, honored in the process. So I think your book, Kid Star, has certainly helped me understand my mom's clutter and why she needed that. And, you know, when I could put it all into context of your life. So that was, I'm so grateful for that because that's an understanding. My mom passed many, many years ago, but it's still wonderful for me to have that understanding here and now to Mm. know that that's a very important part. And also her kindness, because I wasn't kind to my mum. I I was a hypersensitive child that nobody understood in my family. And and then I had all this on top of it and I struggled. And now I feel like, you know, I can I can speak about her with a lot more kindness and understanding. And so I'm grateful for that as well. Well, and so, what beautiful generational healing you're doing, <laughs> right? The life you're living heals your your family line. It's the healing work the the kindness, love and compassion release work you're doing heals your mom also, whether she's here or beyond, you know, so it's, I really commend you for doing this work because we can heal generational trauma, even if we're the only ones showing up for the journey, you know, you're doing beautiful work by doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you for that, Star. I like in your book also that you have a prep list of what people need to collate before they even begin. Oh, uh, when I read that, I went, ding, ding. (laughs) How important is this? So why is this important? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, because it is just so easy to get distracted, isn't it? It's just, so I, I have 10 steps to get and stay organized. I try to make it as simple as possible. Most people think of organizing as one or two things. Oh, it's getting rid of things or it's putting it in pretty boxes. And the truth is there's 10 steps. And one of those steps is to create a toolbox and like have it with you when you organize. And that could be post-its, a Sharpie, label maker, scissors, whatever you need, you know, garbage bags. And (laughs) so, you know, if your listeners want the 10 steps, I always give it away for free because I feel like we all need an entry point for how to organize because it's hard to do the deeper work without having the basic fundamentals in place. So your um, wonderful listeners can get that from organizingiseasy.com. And they can learn all about the 10 steps. But the toolbox step is like one of the most important ones because you know when you start a project and you begin working and then you're suddenly like, oh, wait, I need Post-its. And then you go to get Post-its, but someone has the TV on and you're like, I love this episode. (laughs) (laughs) And then you're like, wait, what was I doing? And then you almost go get the Post-its and then you find a battery and you're like, I should put this in the other room because I'm working there. And then you start in like suddenly four hours have passed and you're like, what was I doing again? So what we want to do is give you all your resources so that when you start to organize, you can just organize and you're not having to splinter your attention all over the place to start organizing. Okay, so so you get that win. You've you've organized a room. And I love the piecemealer approach that you take. It doesn't have to be the whole house. It can just be one small area you start with, get a win. How do you go about maintaining that once yeah. you've done that? Yeah. Thank you for saying that. So if any of you are thinking, oh yeah, I just need to organize my entire room please, for the love of all things holy, don't. Like start small, (laughs) get the 10 steps and then just do your junk drawer or your nightstand. Like start small because most of us have experienced a lot of what we perceive to be failures when we're organizing and we need wins. We need to raise your confidence, help you learn to trust yourself again. And so once you're starting to organize, what you're looking for when it comes to your maintenance is where are you backsliding? 
what is not maintaining in that space? Like you want a routine, absolutely, you know, and we want like if you one of the great things that I always talk about is like laundry. Laundry is a great routine because we have to do laundry at a certain point. And most of us do it at a, like a regular interval. So I do mine once a week. Some people do it once a month. Some people do it every you know 24 hours if you have children. So it just really varies. So what I'll do sometimes is, you know, when we like are in the closet and you're trying on clothes and you decide against wearing that shirt, but you don't want to hang it up. So you throw it on the treadmill or the chair and then you walk away and then you're like, why is the room such a mess? What I tell people to do is get an empty laundry hamper devoted just to clean clothes. Toss it in there or a shelf or wherever you want of one designated place. And then when you go to do your laundry, you dump that clean laundry in with the freshly clean laundry. You fold it all and put it away. You're not adding on, creating a new system, forcing yourself into some painful thing. Piggyback systems onto things you're already doing. It makes it so much easier. But you can start really like, you can really start by looking at what's not maintaining. How do you create a maintenance? You notice what requires a little bit more attention a little bit more action. Okay. And you also mentioned that everybody is an organizing genius. Yes. But but we were going, no, but I'm not. Yeah. (laughs) How do we know that? (laughs) Well, because I guarantee you have a preference for where certain items are kept. Everyone has something in their home that matters to them more than anything else that they always know where it is and they are always on top of it. And what's hard sometimes, and and some of the most um, the most disorganized seeming people are the most organized. And oftentimes, what's what's going on is their systems aren't detailed enough. So you see this a lot with people who have ADHD, for example. So sometimes they they want to build a system, and unfortunately, like they'll do a system that's too simple for their brain. Their brain has too many categories. So it becomes a chaotic mess because they don't actually have what they need. So oftentimes, yes, what we see more often than someone who's naturally disorganized is someone who maybe struggles with executive functioning, who has a hard time maintaining their day-to-day you know, schedule and life. And some of that is learned. Some of that is in our brain and just how we're wired. But you can learn and you can grow and you can continue to develop, to develop those skills. Wonderful, wonderful. How, what would be your advice on dealing with a loved one's possessions, someone who's no longer with us? I'm so glad you made that distinction because my first answer was don't. I was like, don't, it's not yours. It's totally fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> if they've passed, that is a very different conversation because there are so many layers and it is so personal. I think that the common, you know, rule of thumb is don't do anything big for a year. Give yourself a year to really make sense of what happened. I know for some people that's not possible. If someone you loved is in an apartment, you're not going to pay rent for a year while you process. So sometimes we are forced to handle things faster. I recommend having people with you, not having to do it alone. If you are comfortable outsourcing it, sometimes you can outsource it. If you're going to outsource it to someone else and, you know, say, for example, have an estate sale or have someone else box things up or donate them, what you want to do is go in and shop. And this sounds horrible, but you're basically going to shop from their house, meaning you take a couple of boxes and you walk through their house and you find the things that are most meaningful to you. What are the most sentimental items? What would you want to have in that visitation memory box so that you can look back and feel connected to them? So instead of taking everything... Even if you're going to box everything up yourself, walk through there and say, what are the most important things? Box those, label them, and take them somewhere separate so that when you're going through the chaos of someone's entire life, the most important things aren't getting lost in the chaos because we have you know millions of objects surrounding us. And so you really want to feel supported yourself. You want to make sure you're it's I there's not really a great phrasing. I'm sorry. I feel like the phrasing is no, no, very no, no. crass, but it's okay. you know, it's like you want to make sure you've pulled the things that are most valuable to you mm-hmm. to honor that person. And then as much as you can just make time and space to grieve as you go, because it's gonna take a lot out of you. Give yourself plenty of time. Try not to give yourself like a quick two-day turnaround or you know, give yourself a little however long you think it's gonna take, give yourself twice as long because it's gonna take a minute. And yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I did too. I took out the things that I definitely wanted to, that were, were important to me about Tal. And yeah. then whenever friends came to visit or what, whatever, I just let them go for it. You know, that's beautiful. You know, like some of your friends loved your clothes. I wanted to do some items of your clothes. And we had a friend that had had all her possessions stolen. And so I just said, please, please, please don't for one moment even think about anything. Just go into that room and just pack up whatever it is that you need. Because it just, I knew that Tara would just love that. That was really yeah. beautiful. And that really helped me a lot. So then I just got down to the final items and I left them there for a while until I was ready. And, That's so uh, beautiful. What a generous, loving gift to, it's funny, you think of one single item from someone you loved and how we might carry that with us through our entire life because we feel them there with us. And what a beautiful gift to offer her friends who that, that was a giant loss for you, a giant loss for your family and community. And they're at such a young, impressionable age. For many of them, it was their first loss. That's yeah. They will never forget their first loss in that way. And so they get to feel her with them in that way. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It just felt right. And I knew that something that she would just love because she was generous like that. She wouldn't have... And she wouldn't have had any qualms about that whatsoever. Okay, look, I'm, I realized like you have been so generous with your time with me oh, today. It's and such I'm... a treat to be here with you. I could talk to you all day. This is yeah. such a lovely conversation. And I'm so grateful. So I just want you to wrap it up with uh, what is it about your book that makes it different to other books on the market out there or, or other shows, in fact, that are talking about clutter and yeah. decluttering? Thank you. So it's, I'm kind of the anti-organizer. I'm an organizer, but I am, I will never forget going to this workshop, this organizing workshop. And they had, I don't know, it was like some sort of like how you, how you think workshop. I mean, yeah. I, it wasn't like Myers-Briggs <laughs> yeah. or anything, but they basically separated the whole room by like logic versus the more creative. And there was two of us on the creative side and every other organizer was on the other side. And I was like, uh, I'm different. Oh. Like, wait a second. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. And so to me, the goal of organizing is not a beautiful curated home that looks just so that you can show off. For me, I'm actually quite disinterested in whether or not your organization looks any specific way. I'm interested in you taking up space, in you setting yourself free, in you living a full and healthy, joyful life right now, and understanding that organizing is a healing journey, not a task to complete. So my job with the book is to walk beside you to really act as your guide to help illuminate some concepts that maybe are really foreign and help you see your clutter from a different perspective. Because if you understand, like I said at the beginning, if you understand the root cause of your clutter, any system, any organizational tool is going to work. And if you don't understand that, none of them are going to work and you're going to stay in that perpetual cycle. So all I'm doing in that book is inviting you to think about your clutter in a new way, a way that will hopefully help you release it from your life for good. That is a great mission, Star. Well done. That's Thank beautiful. You. So what is the best thing that's happened to you so far today? Oh, what a great question. I took a nap. <laughs> like <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it, that. It was like, you know, when it's like the right nap, when you, you know, sometimes you take a nap and you wake up and you're like, Ugh, it wasn't enough or it was too much. Or, and it was like, I just hit that perfect nap threshold. And it was, and my bedroom was cool. It was autumn and there was everything beautiful about my life right in that oh, moment. Oh, I love it. And it's giving yourself permission as well. Very oh. much. I'll take self-care wherever I can get her. <laughs> she can just step in anywhere. <laughs> what are you most grateful for to date in your life? Oh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that my baseline emotion is love because it makes me... It makes me just feel open at all times and just so much connection. Oh, oh, mic drop on that. That is amazing. <laughs> that is so cool. You know, it's so, funny, Helen. I yep. remember going to Burning Man and yep. I remember being around people doing ecstasy. I, and, and I remember thinking the way they feel on ecstasy is how I feel all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah. I was like, but don't you feel that way all the time? You don't feel that, <laughs> that perpetual love all the time? <laughs> like, no. No. That's something that I'm trying to live my life with now is just to have grace and to live with love. If you're putting out love, you are going to get that back. And yeah. I love that concept. Yeah. When you're having moments in your day that are not going so well, and we have this term when they're turning to custard, what do you do to pivot out of that? I breathe. When I stop, close my eyes, breathe, get connected to creator, source is ideal. But if I can, if I just have the energy to breathe for three or five breaths really consciously, that's enough to pivot me. And, and you know, I'm human. Sometimes it takes me five hours or three days to remember <laughs> that breath, but I will get there eventually. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. The power of breath. I think so many people underestimate that and truly it's a life changer for us. So I'm going to have the links to in the episode notes to everything that you've talked about, your yes. book, those links. Um, Can I the give them resources. one more gift? Yes. And I was just going to say anything else you'd like to share. Yeah. So I would love to give your wonderful listeners a free copy of my book. Now, you can get the book on Amazon or you can get it on, you know, Audible. But if you go to starhansen.com forward slash podcast, you yeah. can get a copy of my book delivered to your email right now. You can also take my monster quiz and find out what monster is hiding in your closet, keeping you disorganized. And if you're interested, you can also learn more about the membership, the community for coming together to organize. So that's just a great place to get a little sample of everything because I know it's a, you know, this is a big journey for a lot of people and we want to go as slow as we need to, to make sure it's right. Star, your heart is truly open. You are so generous. And oh. definitely, I've just written down all of that so I can remember to add that also. I just want to thank you so very much. This is an interview that was so unexpected for me because it took me places I wasn't expecting. I'm normally really prepared. I know where it's going to go and how it's going to go. But your energy is so beautiful. It's so loving. It's so open. I can only imagine what it's like for people working with you and dealing with something that's caused them deep heartache and all sorts of other emotions and how they must be so grateful to you, grateful mm. that you've, you, you are helping them know a different way to live and a different way to exist. So that's how I feel having you on this show, that you've just given us an insight into how we can look at our clutter from such a different perspective. And I am so very, very grateful and thankful to you, Star, for doing that. Oh, thank you so much, Helen. It's it's just an absolute honor to be here with you today. I'm so grateful to your listeners for being here too. I think we're, I feel this beautiful um, synergy we're creating together, this beautiful power of healing that all of us are showing up for. So you've created something really beautiful here. And I'm just very honored to have been invited to come have this conversation with you today. My pleasure to have you. Thanks for listening. I hope you got some real value from this episode. If there's a topic you'd like covered, click on the beautiful side of grief at gmail.com link or go into the beautiful side of grief.com website where you can also leave a review. To get notified of new episodes, hit the subscribe button. And if you know of somebody who could benefit from this episode, please share, share, share. And until next time, please be kind to you and take good care.